have they got that entrepreneurial spirit and um, are they up for having some fun along the way? And if it is, then sounds like something for us. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I will be speaking with Russell Potter, one of the founders of London's multiple award-winning Soda Studio. So Soda has worked across London uh, with several projects in Soho, including a 5,000 square meter regeneration of Walker's Court, which looks very cool. Um, It's been completed over eight years. The project created a new theater, restaurant, shops, flat, office space, and restored home for Madame Jojo's nightclub which in my youth I used to play many a gig in there when I was in a band very very cool so very happy that somebody has totally refurbished that Um, in North London Soda created Greens Room the UK's first social enterprise hotel providing affordable living accommodation and studio space for local artists in Wood Green and Harrogate and in Silverdown in the Royal Dock Soda worked with the GIA in a landmark retrofit of a brutalist former beer factory which now hosts a series of meanwhile artist studios so Soda a really interesting um, business here um, and it was a great pleasure to actually sit down and speak with Russell I've been a fan of their work um, and the whole company's identity for quite a long time and it was really interesting to speak with Russell because we dived into a number of different topics one talking about winning work um, and the kind of strategies that they that they use how they develop and cultivate long-lasting relationships which incubates uh, repeat work um, how they've kind of used le- the where they've been located in London to network and develop communities around them we talk about uh, working with your spouse as Russell and Laura are a married couple with children um, and we talk about the kind of um, challenges and the opportunities that arise from working so closely with a loved one and we also talk about identity and branding a design firm and what was important to them uh, in the kind of communication of their firm's identity so sit back relax and enjoy Russell Potter of Soda. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Russell, welcome to the Business of Architecture. We finally made it. How are you? Hello. Yeah, finally. Uh, yeah, very good. Thank you. How are you? I'm, I'm excellent. So good. you are one of the uh, co-founding partners of Soda based in London. You guys do some really interesting work from there's a real array, a very broad kind of uh, palette, if you like, of portfolio that you've got from um, residential work to community work to retail to kind of branding experience um types of things very innovative experimental collaborative design group there's lots of different disciplines that you've got in house for you um and you've i I mean i think you guys are you're, you're very switched on in terms of your marketing and publicity and the kind of message that you portray in the in the architectural press and then to your target sectors um so excited to speak to you and it's a real it's a real pleasure so wow. i guess the, the, fir- I'm the first question <laughs> thank you very kind of <laughs> oh no I will, now, I will now try and like unravel all of that and show you the real you know really what happened <laughs> so so tell me a little bit how did you and laura um start the practice what was the what was the initial vision yeah um god going back a bit now as I said, it's taken a while to get to get together on this on this podcast hasn't it but um yeah, so um, what was it now? Nearly twelve years ago. So um, Lara and I, uh, we're married as well, as, as architects quite often tend to do. Um, everyone who is an architect and listening to this probably will realise that we're a very strange breed. So that's probably why we have to. Um, it's a whole, it's own. a whole niche in itself of, of married couples doing architecture together. Yeah, yeah, a, a absolutely. whole unique, set, a, whole, a whole unique set of challenges as well. Quite right. Um, it's only me here today, so you'll only get one side, I'm afraid. But um, yeah, we met at uh, we met doing our our part two. So I, I did my part one up in Nottingham. Lara did hers in Oxford Brooks. Then we both met doing our part two in Westminster. And um, yeah, we both went off and and did our did our separate things and went to, to different practices. 
but actually kind of set up remarkably, you know, sooner than we'd sort of thought. We'd always talked about wanting to set up our own practice together. Um, and we're just sort of really waiting for the right opportunity. So as, as sort of typically with lots of architecture practice, uh, Lara, Lara started it by herself, although with me in the background and the, and the thought that I'd always join with more residential projects. Um, and I continued working and then I joined about a year or so later. So it's about now about 12 years ago. Um, and yeah, brought some more kind of commercial projects and it, wor it worked, you know, really well for us. I think we've got different skill sets. Um, as I say, it wasn't without its challenges. I think the very first day we actually, you know, physically worked together, Lara, we kept, we went home and Lara looked at me and she said, I, I hate you at work. And I was like, <laughs> oh, okay. Um, but I guess, I guess we've all got sort of slightly different personalities or tones of voice or whatever it is in the way that we do things professionally compared to how we do things personally. So I think that was that was quite a quick eye opener to to experience well, that, well, that, that person. I mean that I mean that that's very interesting. I know, know my own relationship with my with my partner when we've done things professionally together. There's a there's a, a different character from both of us that that comes out, and there is quite a learning sure. curve to be like to be like whoa. Okay, this is how this this person is doing. How do you how did you kind of learn to to manage that? Like, and how how, how, how do you know how, how do you switch it off and switch it back on? Well, I, I think that I mean put back to that kind of slightly tongue in cheek comment about you know lots of architects being with other architects or or people in similar industries. I guess it it's one of those things that you don't really switch off. I mean, I hope I'm not alone in saying that you can't just switch off. Yeah. It's not a nine to five kind of job. So I guess that side of it is is great that there can be an understanding that you are, you know, when you do go home and there's projects running around your heads or whatever else, either you can actually, you know, talk talk it through with someone else if you want to, or even if you don't, at least there's an acknowledgement of a slight understanding. I think, you know, other friends we've got who, you know, maybe they're an architect and then their partner is a lawyer or something, you know, completely removed potentially there's that just there's just not that understanding and i think that's yeah it's a nice it's a nice thing to have but yeah in a day-to-day -day kind of um circumstance it did you know in all honesty and i'm sure larry remember saying it, it took a while to kind of find our to, to work that out in, in the office and i think gradually we kind of worked out sort of each other's strengths and weaknesses and having having that kind of super close relationship with your partner you know your business partner being your life partner means that you there is no holds barred. You don't you don't bottle anything up. You don't um, have to hold anything back. So once you kind of get through that, and I think, yeah, the way I think we sort of well, the way I certainly kind of describe it now, and the way that we work quite in quite, quite complementary ways is that I sort of feel that architects can be described by the type of pen that they use. So I'd, I'd say I'm more of a more of a fat pen architect. You know, bit of a bit of a squiggle and maybe a bit of a bigger picture type thing. Whereas Lara's definitely a very fine. Yeah, a fine line nice detail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, whereas I'm just some sort of chunky old Crayola or something. But yeah, no, and I think that's kind of the the kind of the niches that we've probably um, made for ourselves. So, in inside as a as a partnership, did you find then it was quite clear where your individual skill sets would be and the kinds of roles and responsibilities that you would take over, or, or was it all kind of mer you know kind of merged together at the beginning? Yeah, no, I mean, it was definitely, it was definitely all hands on deck at the beginning. As I say, we, when I um, eventually joined, we had a larger um, commercial project. So our first one, which is uh, the Soho house we did, I'm just pointing, uh, mm -hmm. up the road in Soho on Dean Street. So it was a, a big client called Soho Estates. They introduced us to Soho House, who are obviously a very famous members club. They bought a building next door. So suddenly it became, you know, a completely different scale. And it was all, hand, you know, I can, again, I can say this out loud. We, uh, we didn't have any staff, so we had to kind of beg and borrow and steal. Um, one of the guys from my former practice came and joined us, and we, you know, that was it. So we were all doing everything. We were all doing the detailing. We were all doing the drawings. We were all just getting stuck in, and then we gradually built our team. Well, quite quickly actually, in that first instance, to about sort of uh, six or eight, I guess, quite quickly, um, which then mm -hmm. became a proper team, and, and then try and evolve and get a bit of structure around it. So. Um, yeah, no, it was definitely, it was more organic in terms of, we never said, right, I'm going to do this and you're going to do that. We didn't have that luxury. You know, we were, we were, <laughs> we were in it and, uh, and sort of up to about here in, uh, in water, but it was great and it was exciting.
so so that that early kind of phase when you were doing the Soho House project was that really like the the project that kind of gave you the the traction to be able to develop and grow a, a grow a team and and how did it do that if that is the case yeah definitely yeah very much so I mean um, yeah we had a as I said we it's kind of quite a long convoluted story so I probably won't go into too much detail but a long story short the building that we were working on was. Uh, had a fire and burnt down the previous owners I, I believe were underinsured or certainly didn't have the money to kind of build it back out and so I was asked as, uh, to present to, to various sort of high net worth individuals and various other people this opportunity to purchase the building um, and they had I don't know, all sorts of weird wonderful ideas about putting it in off- offshore and doing this that and the other so I'm not quite sure how uh, how <laughs> legal any of that was i was an innocent bystander to the point that i was just talking through <laughs> my nice drawings anyway long story short we met at, we, were, uh, we were at university during a you know pretty much just or just finished our part two or part threes and we went to a friend's birthday party and i saw this guy in the corner i was like I sort of recognize that guy but i couldn't work, put my finger on it i went over to speak to him and he was one of the guys who i had presented to uh, as a potential buyer I said, oh, hey, how you doing? It turns out he was the cousin of a friend of someone or someone at this party. So very, very strange. And I just said, hey, you, know, you know, hey, how's it going? Did you did you bid on it? Did you get it? He said, no, we, we didn't get it. But um, we had some guys in Soho, Soho States have bought it. And that was it. And I just, so that was on the Friday or Saturday night, whenever the party was. And mm-hmm. on the Monday, I'd, I'd, I'd never heard of them. I Googled them, looked them up, found their head of development, rang him up and said, um, do you want an architect? And he said, yes, please. Um, and it, so it grew from there, you know, we, yeah, so we, you know, that, that was pretty quick. Um, and then he said, but we don't want to do your office scheme. We want to buy another building and tie it in and we'd like to introduce you to a house. We'd like to do that, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, that was, I guess the platform, you know, we had to grow a team to deliver that project. Um, mm-hmm. and then, you know, the, the amazing thing about Soho and why I'm very pleased that we're back here, we, you know, our, our office was here before we then moved to Clerkenwell for five years and we then came back a couple of years ago, but they call Soho the village. And, um, you know, I, I remember, you know, very fondly those days where we had one client, but we would walk down the street to a meeting with them and you'd stop and you'd be introduced to, this is Russell Norman. He's got the Polpo Group. He, he needs a, you know, oh, I need an architect. Great. Okay. And then this is someone else. And this is Simon Hammerstein from the box. And it is literally like being in a village and you'd walk through and it was all through yeah. word of mouth. And so that meant that those projects grew organically through word of mouth, but, but then needed resourcing appropriately. And so, yeah, absolutely. So, it was always. So imagine that working with a client was so, like Soho House, that's um, number one, like the, the nature of it being a kind of um, high end hospitality group. Um, there's a lot of liaising and a lot of, lot of potential to connect with all sorts of other people. Plus, you've got your once the project's been completed, you know, there's a high amount of traffics of potentially, you know, good clients yeah. who can who can get in contact and, and also loads of introductions and things that are happening. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we learned a huge amount from them. They were there. I mean, they're now, I, I wouldn't even like to guess the numbers they've got, but certainly back in the day, they had, you know, a handful of interior designers in house and, um, mm-hmm. and a couple of architects. And it actually, we would pass them CVs because they were growing their design team internally, which is sort of doing yeah. us, us out of a job. But, um, yeah, we learned so much, you know, it was very, very collaborative nature. Nick Jones is, you know, a, a mercurial talent and he would draw all over things and scribble on things. And then you'd get, a phone, you'd just leave the office and you get a phone call 20 minutes later. Say, I've got another idea to come back. Um, mm. But that, and that ran through, you know, from like say from their operations team, they were, they were all kind of fantastic and, and knew everything they're doing through to their bookings team and everyone, all these different people were having eyes on your designs and inputting into them. Um, and that's before you, as you say, you get it across the line, but you're right. The, the nature of, a hospitality project like that or a restaurant or whatever it is, is is fantastic in terms of being able to take potential future clients there and actually show them a product open you know if you other offices that we've done for example are, are or you know private jobs we've done is is tricky to be able to go back and get that keep that connection going and show people it so yeah definitely that's been a really good kind of calling card for sure Amazing, and and so your when you were doing the Soho House project, you were you were based in Soho as a business, and then you moved to Clerkenwell. Now recently, you've come back to Soho, and is and, and was your 
was your kind of return to Soho to do with uh, did you guys did the Raymond review updates? Yeah, in fact, it's just probably almost out the window, just behind me over there. Yeah, um, I love it. I mean, no, I've, it I've, I've walked, past it, walked past it a few times. I used to used to be in a band and played many gigs in Madame Jojo's and stuff. So, oh, did you? Oh, amazing. Remember, remember a very seedy past to, to to that part of town, but I, you know, love it. Very fond memories. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. And, and you guys have really captured, you know, something quite special about it and brought it brought it up to date, and but still kept its character. Yeah, no, it was great. I mean, it was, um, yeah, like I said, really, that was, a, again, another kind of very sprawling project where it started off, I think the brief was um, restore the neon sign and put a, put a single story office on top. And it ended up, you know, designing a, a brand new theatre from scratch, which is suspended two floors in the air and the whole thing rotates through 360 degrees through various mechanics and this, that and the other through to digging oh. a double story basement to put Madame Jojo's back in kind of bigger and better form and, and there's retail and there's residential and there's you know, just about everything. So that was a fantastic project. Um, but no, you, back to the question, moving back here, I don't think, it, well, it, it's not linked specifically to a project. You know, you could very well service, you know, it's only Farringdon and you've got the Elizabeth line now, so you can be here in two minutes going across. But um it's more, I think there's two things. I think one, initially when we went to, to Clerkenwell, we, I think, probably wanted to test ourselves that we weren't being pigeonholed as, as sort of a Soho architect, if that sounds like mm -hmm. too much of a silly thing. It, you know, it's something we're amazingly mm -hmm. proud of. But So I think we wanted to sort of test ourselves and, and, and be somewhere different and, and, and not be tied, tied to Soho in, in such a way. Um, but and but then I think the return coming back is that it is in our it's part of our DNA and who we are. And I think I was talking to someone just the other day that you know we, when we obviously do projects further, much further afield, as so we've got one in Manchester, one in Liverpool, but you know, and all around London and elsewhere. But I think there's something really strong and amazing about being able to deliver a project in Soho because it, there's so many eyes on it all the time mm -hmm. you know there's there's um, very vocal kind of local groups there's residential groups there's local business groups there's then there's the press and then there's everyone who's kind of just has a fond attachment to it so you're you're constantly under this spotlight and I think hopefully what we've kind of shown over the last few years is that if you can deliver the types of projects that we have in Soho then you can apply that where, wherever you are and so I guess the, and it was a five-year, you know, detour by Clerkenwell, and we and we loved it there, and it was we're in an amazing space, and again we met amazing people and everything else. But sure. it was also just our lease kind of coming up. Um, uh, I think we we're just coming out of COVID, and our lease was running was coming up, so we thought, well, actually, this is a great time to just reinvigorate ourselves and kind of get stuck back in. And as everyone will will yeah. know, who's in London, the the kind of vibe around so Soho is one of the first places to pick back up after COVID just in terms of bodies and numbers on the street. So it was a real nice boost for the team to kind of come and, um, yeah, feel invigorated and get, get stuck in again. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's interesting that you say kind of Soho is part of your, your DNA and there's a, a very clear brand with Soda that's very, very distinct from so many other architectural practices, which is very difficult to kind of to pull off. Um, and, you know, when I think about you guys, and, you know, certainly the, the kind of connection with Soho is a lot, I don't know, it's my opinion. It's, it's, it's a lot cooler than Clerkenwell as a bit of as a bit of town, and yes. it kind of it, it also sorts of you know for a lot of the ki types of clients that you're doing and the kind of work that you're doing that sort of brand equity of being the kind of the cool out of the box forward thinking architects is you know that's that's quite important. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the how you've come up with the brand and your sort of the the image that you've created around soda and i mean obviously the name is quite unusual in itself yeah the uh, yeah so, so the name we were always very keen so i think i think again we touched on earlier about the kind of the drivers about why we wanted to set up but that we were all i mean first point is that we would always describe ourselves as a studio we're not an office and we're not a practice and that is mm -hmm. that is probably the most fundamental thing you could argue, you know, fine, it's just semantics, but the studio ethos is about experimentation. It's about freedom. It's about collaboration. It's about all those things. And both Lara and I have been in practices before where 
you know, there's deadly silence and the person sat, sat three feet to your left is emailing you saying, do you want to meet for lunch? It's like, what? No, no, talk. Let's let's talk. Let's talk. Yeah. Let's not have headphones in. Let's uh, let's be a team. So so that was the genuine kind of driver was to create a studio. And I think with that comes a sort of certain re- relaxation of the a lot of the drivers behind architecture i think you know what we do is 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 very serious and you know and and there are lots of responsibilities and lots of you know rules and regulations and all those kind of things but at the heart of it for us it has to be fun it has to be enjoyable so it was all always about creating a studio the original reason for soda or one of was that we we well, a couple of reasons it, originally when we started it it stood for studio of design and architecture which not many people know because we got rid of that pretty quickly because it was pretty pretty crappy and excellent and quite <laughs> quite work. But uh, I think there are a few key things in there. That one one is first and foremost it's a studio, and I guess the point of design and architecture was that we didn't want to just do architecture, and that's not to play that down. You know, there are architects who are architects through and through, and they're like a stick of rock, and you cut them in half, and it would say architect, you know, from the tips of their toes to the top of their head. But I don't think. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lara and I are like that. We've always had our influences and interests have been far, far further afield, you know, whether that's music or fashion or art or whatever it might be. So I think that design and architecture bit, so the, that was all kind of quite interesting. We, in terms of the brand and our representation, I think it it's quite interesting because lots of people have said that there is kind of a a very well I don't know it's interesting because there's there is a, certainly a thread through it but equally I think any one of our projects um, they're quite different um, so to kind of put a tangible like to work out what exactly what that thread is like what makes a soda project it's hard <laughs> hard to kind of pin down it's not really an answer is it um, but no there, there's certainly a thread but I think that it, and I think the you know, I guess maybe that's our, our eye and we're still, we've got an amazing team and we give them loads and loads of freedom, especially, you know, mm-hmm. the stage that we're at now to run projects and to kind of represent ideas graphically in different ways. And um, we will always be involved in those projects, but I guess that's probably the kind of melting pot is that there's a, there's an, a, you know, an overarching kind of a view and an ethos, which I think we try and set to people when they come and join us. Yeah. Um, but within those kind of loose parameters, there's, there's a lot of freedom to kind of to take that design in different directions and it's still got to kind of hit all the right kind of keynotes but there are multiple ways of doing that so I guess that kind of it's more like a a kind of collective of projects I think and I think um, I've certainly always viewed that our our portfolio should be kind of like an album um, Mm -hmm. and a kind of track list on an album I don't mean like a Spotify album where you only get one song and no one listens to the rest of it one (laughs) one 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 killer ten filler they've all got to be killer but the um, I think, you know, I, I visualize that through, yeah, an album track list. And maybe this, you know, track number two says featuring so-and-so and it's got a guest vocalist or it's got a guest producer. Or it's got a guest, And I think those tracks can all be different, but they've got to still make a, a whole album. Amazing. So t- tell me a little bit about, um, you know, when you, when you kind of grew the team back, you know, in Soho House project when that project started to kind of conclude how what was your structure if you like or strategy for going about winning new work and were you very focused on particular like focusing in on particular sectors or were you attracted to certain types of clients who were doing certain things or was it kind of more random and organic yeah it's um yeah no to be honest we didn't we deliberately didn't uh, grow, which sounds sort of slightly, or, or kind of have an eye on, on on growth and new clients. We, which is sort of slightly suicidal, but I think hopefully it's proven that we were right in this instance. And we, you know, we had um, kind of certain people, mentors, and advisors who we'd speak to, and they'd say, you know, look, be careful because you've got you've got a lot of your eggs in in one basket here. But we were very yeah. much so. That, for example, the you know the so a house project on on Dean Street, then the Walker's Court project behind me. Then Ketner's, which is another project for with with the same landlord and, and um, tenant combination. But we were just absolutely dead set on on completely cementing that relationship and and delivering it to the absolute best of our ability. And I think we were slightly worried about either a growing too fast um, and not man- maintaining that kind of quality and that 
personal involvement in those early projects but also equally as important as the projects is the relationship with with those kind of key personnel in them whether that's the client or the project manager and whatever so a lot of our time and effort early on was just about making that as kind of rock you know rock solid and bulletproof as we can in hindsight especially you know considering the changes that we've all been through recently with covid and brexit and banks and all that kind of stuff it was probably a bit foolhardy but i think that's also why a lot of young practices do do amazing work because you're not sort of tainted by the sensible kind of you know you've got your kind of slightly crazy weird voice over here and then the more sensible one over here and i think we were probably just listening a lot more to that one because he was more fun um yeah. so we didn't we didn't kind of we didn't target we didn't do any marketing we just absolutely cemented those and we wanted to get them completed to the best of our ability and then use those as our calling card um and and that's what we did and we kind of then you know we knew we knew we had to do them well and do them right and get the kind of the press and the media attention for them and and use that as a calling card and take other people there but it was more i think we were we've always been completely disinterested in in kind of pigeonholing ourselves right. and and by that i mean kind of sector and scale as well so it was never about okay let's just do members clubs or let's just do offices or whatever it want to be i think and i think that um loads of people have said to us why don't you just yeah we, we had a really good spell where we did loads of um office spaces for for the office group and, and for landsec and various other. so i said why don't you just specialize in offices and just just do that and then you can just become known it's like i can't think of anything more boring than just doing the same thing like the thing that excites me is is that one day it's a theater and the next day it's an office and the next day it's a house and the next day it's an exhibition that's what personally excites me so yeah. we've never kind of targeted um particular sectors um we have on occasion targeted certain clients because we've either seen what they're doing or we've admired what they're doing mm -hmm. or we think what, we've, what we have done would sort of be a really good stepping stone as an introduction. But I th a lot of it is, is, is very organic. And I guess, being completely honest, I, I think a target for us going forward, you know, we have various plans going forward, but um, it is to be more proactive. We are quite mm -hmm. reactive at the moment, and a lot of it is about just be, just reacting to who's seen our bit of press or who's picking up the phone and saying, oh, we've got a project here we'd like to talk about. Um, and we would probably like to be a bit more proactive and say, you know, we've, we've got a good portfolio now, we've got a really good team. Um, let's go after those people. Why not? No one's off limits. Let's go for those. Let's go for those. And what's what's the worst that can happen? So, yeah, still right. quite reactive, but um, aiming to be a bit more proactive. So, so if there was a situation where you, you know you look at your 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 cash flow forecast and you notice that there's a bit of a dip or there's projects coming to a con to a conclusion, and you need mm. to fill up the fill up the pipeline again, what's the sort of thing that you do to kind of get you know, to, to bring in more projects? That's a good question. The, I mean, I, I think I, I sort of hinted at the, the, the maintaining of, of, of relationships, of existing relationships, I think is, is always kind of the first port of call, you know, building mm -hmm. that time, that relationship and trust with someone, you know, let's face it, someone who's going to, who's going to, employers they're going to spend a lot of money you know they either need to buy a building then they spend a lot on it there's a lot of fees there's a lot of everything else so people don't just do that on a whim typically you have to build that up through time and i think we've, we've kind of looked at you know the sort of um, gestation period for a project tends to be about six months as a minimum really to, to kind of from mm -hmm. someone even hinting at it uh, uh, sort of glint in their eye to actually getting you know your signed appointment so i guess we're constantly kind of doing that but yeah a lot of our clients you know i mean i can probably count the number of clients that haven't been repeat clients on on one hand everyone that we're wow. talking to um we have done multiple projects with so that would always be the first port of call just to reach out and be like hey you know whatever you know not speaking for a while how's things going yeah and using anchoring it around something that that's kind of noteworthy and newsworthy i think it's always really good so you know don't know if you've seen we just completed this project thought of you you know great to catch up and yeah. i think those relationships are so key so that would always be the first point of call i think i don't know it'd be interesting um and i've, I've listened on a few of your podcasts that i've listened to about people who do kind of do more of a kind of cold calling approach which i'm you know very um 
interested in because it's not been something we we do and it's not something we've we've really tried but you know it does work but i think you've just got to be prepared to have that kind of phone slam down or that rejection or just that blunt no over and over and over yeah. again but it can still reap rewards but no so it's always kind of going back through our back through our channels but but also branching out to kind of similar like-minded individuals and i think yeah, that's probably absolutely. the the one thing we've noticed, although our projects are different, our clients are different, the sex are different. I think the one mm-hmm. thing that we've, and it took us a long time to work this out, the one thing that ties them together is the kind of entrepreneurial spirit of the main client. Um, right. And I think that's where, I don't know how or why, but I think that's where we've done our best projects when we you know, generally believe and excited by what that vision of the, of the kind of main client is and how we can help them bring that out so I think spotting that that spirit and that might be someone who's just done I don't know an amazing catwalk in Milan and, and they're a fashion designer or it might be someone doing something completely different or it might be someone doing some amazing kind of product whatever it is I think that's that's the, what we'd look for and who we'd, who we'd approach and that's that's very interesting that kind of yeah being attracted to that visionary client if you like or the entrepreneurially mm. led um, 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 client um in terms of let's talk about money a little bit and the kind of the, the the subject that many architects kind of struggle with, or perhaps it doesn't become part of common parlance in their own practices. What sorts of things, and certainly as your practice has now you know, grown, it's a decent a decent size for an architect practice. How has the conversation around money evolved or changed? And what sorts of things do you do to protect fo- um, profit and kind of make sure that your fees are well structured? Yeah, no, I think yeah, you're right. It's one of those funny topics, isn't it? And I remember sort of always our first fee proposals we'd send out was sort of almost sending out with a, an apologetic tone to them or sort of, um, <laughs> but actually you realise that... Sorry you know, we have to charge, but we do. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry we have to do this, but is it okay if we possibly have a little bit of money to eat? Um, so, no, I think we, there's a few sort of brilliant, brilliant kind of things that have, have happened over the over the kind of past few years that, that certainly help. Um, one is that we know our market position a lot better now from from bidding on things and competitions and just being upfront about asking for kind of honest feedback, whether you win it or not, about where you're pitching, where you're, um, you know, okay, we didn't get this one. Were we too high? No, were we too low? Well, you know, just so I think we, we're very confident now in the level that we want to pitch ourselves at and we don't want to be the cheapest we also don't want to be most expensive but you know we we want to offer good value um would never try and undercut someone just because i mean what's sure. what, where's where's the joy in that and then you're constantly chasing well, it only, uh, yeah and it only goes one way when we start yeah exactly that game. so no one's we do, well i wouldn't say no one some people do but anyway the and then and also we don't want to go back we want to we want, want to agree a, a a, a fair and decent fee that we're happy to kind of commit to unless something completely changes obviously but i also don't want to be going back and saying oh please can we have a little bit more and oh we you know we did this a bit wrong can we have this because clients don't like that either so i guess that's the kind of out, outward going sort of confidence in 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 the fee proposals that's also backed up by um the software that we use now so we've got we we do a lot of work on timesheets and cost rates and we know all our overheads we know every, everything intimately now and we've got mm-hmm. kind of great software. We've got again because we've got those experiences. If uh, if we've got a certain project, let's say it's an office fit out, we've done various ones of those before. We can immediately benchmark against figures that we did before, and the amount of resource we put in different areas, and the amount of costs that that hit. So we can be quite confident saying, you know, actually, yeah, we were a bit light there, or we weren't, um, or we didn't allow enough time for that bit. So I think the the two kind of the two are hand in hand, um, and also you know in terms of the sort of the price point, the resourcing levels, which we can now do very accurately in house, and also then um, sort of conference around the program, and because obviously what we are, apart from our kind of artistic vision and technical ability and whatever else it might be, the main thing that we're dealing with is, is time. That's the only thing we've got. So um, not signing up or being kind of feeling kind of forced into signing up to a ridiculously ambitious program where you're signing up for whatever. 10 months worth of fee but you actually know that it's going to be 18 months you know then there's already you're already setting yourself up for yeah. an awkward discussion so just being again so confident how, and how using you, our how sorry. do you how do you structure the fees at that from the outset because this is always the the you know complicated thing and particularly when you're working with a visionary 
type of client, you know that there's going to be, you know, you know that art, you don't know what you're doing to begin with, really. There's a, there's a kind of vision and you know that vision's got the capacity to grow and to shift and to change. Sure. How do you kind of protect yourself so that you're not making a commitment to like being locked into a fee that's not going to yeah. work? I think that's, I think that's absolutely right. And, uh, and you know, we have, we have probably fallen foul of that before. Um, I think it's, it's recognizing that and just building in some, some leeway and some kind of points uh, and equally no one's going to sign an appointment if it's just an open-ended checkbook. So I think we are quite happy to kind of explore early things, uh, you know, feasibility studies, whatever that might be and try and bottom it out. I think one of the key things that we now do, um, sort of as early on as we can is just to repeat the, the brief back to the client as we see it say look this is what we've got from and it might because it's not always you don't get a formal kind of written brief from from certain clients you know it's over a conversation or it's this or it's a whatsapp message saying oh actually why don't we do this <laughs> so it's kind of just repeating those back and saying is this what you think and hoping that <laughs> hoping to to high heavens that it hasn't changed but no so then and then that gives us a bit of confidence i guess to peg a fee a resource a time to to that particular bit and just sort of saying look of course and doing it in a nice way i think not to try and get over overly contractual but still having something in an appointment that says of course you know should these sorts of things change we, we, we we're going to need to have a discussion about it and mm-hmm. just being sort of honest and, and giving that a heads up um i think as as we said sort of having a, a reasonable fear in the first place means that you can be a bit more flexible without having to go oh we didn't allow for that oh we didn't you know oh i did an extra sketch can i have 10 pounds that no one likes to keep doing those and that sort of death by a thousand cuts but i think paying it something tangible with enough fat in it that you can be really responsive and really nimble and be there for the client when they want to call you up and and make a kind of random change at whatever time it might be but also being um being able to have that conversation so look enough's enough kind of thing in terms of like monitoring projects and kind of their profitability you said that you've got some quite sophisticated software there that you that Mm. you use so you've got a very close eye on your overheads is it something now that your project managers or your project architects they're kind of they're in the numbers they like there's a budget uh, allocated to a specific project and they're monitoring that and helping kind of create uh timelines and allowances for time spent on projects how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, and with the with the sort of size of practice that we've we've become now, and the team we've got, so we're kind of mid. What are we? Twenty two, I think, at the moment, full time mm-hmm. staff. Um, and within that, we've now got kind of um, well, we've got amazing talent throughout. You know, everyone. We're, as I said, first and foremost, we're a studio, and we've always had amazing people. That's been the most, the biggest emphasis we've put on it. But actually, the group we've got right now are amazing to a t it, you know there's no there's no one there's no sort of dead dead wood there and uh, and equally they get on really well with each other and it's all great but the the sort of senior team we've got in place now we involve them earlier on in terms of our fee proposals so rather than it just being handed down and being like right we've got this fee and you've got to deliver it in that time it's actually getting the kind of project runners to feed into that to look at you know are the programs and time scale right do we think the resourcing is right who are the available people do we need do we have any gaps in that um and getting their buy-in to that as well so that they're not feeling aggrieved when you know well there's a deadline in six weeks and they're like well yeah but you signed up to that and we're the ones who've got to do it so what you know how does that give so sure. having having greater transparency in the studio with the senior team is is great and they can feed that down the timesheets every week go back into it. Each stage has an allotted budget next to it, so we can kind of keep tracking it. Obviously, you know, with the best will in the world, nothing ever goes completely according to the to the plan. Sure. But at least there's a plan in the first place, and we can tweak things. And we have resourcing meetings, uh, you know, every week with the senior guys and just monitor each project and go. Actually, this deadline's moved or that. Can we borrow a bit of resource from this or that? But yeah, no, it seems to. I mean, I'm touching touching wood here. It seems to be quite a good system that we've got in place where we can kind of just really kind of be on top of it all and it doesn't need to be um overbearing and kind of feel like this sort of thing that you have to kind of look at every single day but you you know we're now quite adept at it and you can just quickly kind of dip in and out or just check on that certain project just Mm -hmm. really high level almost literally at a glance and just check where it is um without getting bogged down so it's a really that's a really useful tool and a development that our team can now get into as well 
in terms of discussing say more higher level finances with the with the rest of the team how transparent are you with with money with profit how the success of the company is there a good culture of that or do you prefer to kind of keep it much more focused amongst the a, a select part of the leadership team yeah i think we we don't generally discuss it across the whole team i think we do when we you know at the end of the year we'll we'll sort of just have a general kind of discussion about you know how we've performed we've made profit we'd like to share some of that with you guys or, or around mm-hmm. that we don't tend to get into the nitty gritty of it i think um it's interesting i'm you know and there have been instances along the line where you know and typically more junior people uh, members of the team have seen a fee and then they've seen their salary and they're like well what the hell's going on that this sure. you know surely i should be getting way more money uh, without understanding all the nuances of, of the kind of overheads and the software costs and the insurance costs and all those things that i guess you only really kind of grow into with a few with a few years experience so it's not necessarily about hiding it but it's just is that a useful conversation to have are those numbers tangible to the people that you're talking yeah. to so i think in in well, short that, well, we don't we don't yeah. kind of discuss it a huge amount with the whole studio but um equally we're, i'm always open to have discussions if that, you want to. That, that's very interesting that that exact point you know there's there is a there is you know when you're being transparent with finances in in a business there's a level of responsibility that the person mm. seeing the numbers needs to be able to have and i've i've shared on the show before you know i've been rung up on a tuesday morning by someone who's listened to the podcast an employee of a business who's just seen how much they're being billed out at and you know mm. they ring me up in a in a, in a I don't know how this person found my phone number for starters and why they thought I was the best person to call and complain to. But uh, it was always remember this, this young person phoned me up and said, and said, Oh, this, we, you know, it's crazy what's happening in my business that I'm working at. I've just found out that my boss is, he's charging me out at three times what he's paying me. Mm. And I was like, hold on a moment. That's like, he's doing the right thing there. That's perfect. Um, yeah, but it's, about but right, obviously yeah. when, when, when you, but when, as I can, and also I'm very empathetic and understanding of like when you're a young architect who doesn't know all of the other mechanisms that are in play, you see something like that and you could be shocked and yeah. feel like, you know, there's, a, there's an advantage being taken or there's exploitation and it can, it can quickly go into that kind of narrative. So there's definitely, like you sure. said, there's a, there's a level of responsibility that, that's needed. I think there's also that. a bandwidth, a bandwidth thing as well, because ge- genuinely, I don't, uh, you know, and and some of our more, our younger, more junior guys, they've never asked. Now, maybe that's they don't feel comfortable enough to do that. But I also wonder if there's a bandwidth thing where you know it's your first job, you're, you're straight out of uni, you're immersed in these great projects, and you're around amazing people, and you're just absorbing everything. I you know I wonder whether I'm just thinking through. It tends to be, as you say, more senior people who who want to get a bit more understanding about it. And we have those conversations yeah. a bit further down the line. But yeah, I almost wonder whether there's a bandwidth thing where it's, you know, there's a lot to take on and a lot to learn, even post your your qualifications and education. So maybe it's a bandwidth thing as well. Absolutely. Um, in terms of your role, how it's changed since when you kind of first, when you and Lara first set the business up, how has your your role changed? What do you find yourself doing more now? And, you know, the things that you've had to let go of or some of the some of the challenges as well that perhaps you found in actually allowing yourself to grow into the into a leadership role yeah interesting the i mean one thing that I, <laughs> the first, well i'm not going to name any names a practice i worked out early on i remember thinking bloody hell these partners are absolute dinosaurs they can't do anything um and i swore to myself that i'd never become one but i am very much definitely a, a, a premature dinosaur in terms of um <laughs> sort of CAD, CAD and software wise. Um, so I don't actually do any kind of draw. I don't do any CAD anymore. Um, mm-hmm. I don't do any modeling anymore. Um, I, I think that's a product through, you know, A, I, I've been kind of doing the, doing some of the other elements of the job, you know, the, the kind of client fronted stuff, the fee stuff, the, the practice management. It, I mean, I, I, I often say that's a very healthy sign when the, the partners of the business don't draw anymore. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, I, I, I think it's part. It's partly that that you know, that it, it necessarily became that way. But also, you know, you, the the guys coming through now, they're so good, and they're doing everything in you know Cinema 4D, and it's it's amazing visuals. And so, it would also I would have had to invest a lot of time in myself to get myself back up to speed, and probably still not do it as well as the guys guys in the studio. Sure. Can. 
Um, so I guess from that point of view, that's that's been a big change. Um, the I still get and we get involved in all the projects across all the stages. I love the kind of early stage bits. I love um, concepts and kind of pitching. And I really enjoy that kind of thrill of the chase of kind of getting uh, getting a new client and, and winning winning a project. And I st and I still like to do that all the way through. I think again necessarily probably from time or anything I don't particularly see things uh, have a site-based role and the kind of stage five and later on um, that tends mm -hmm. to be the project architects who kind of take that through again just because that kind of consistency of having the same people on it I, I will obviously still go and, and visit a site and go and look at key points and, and those sorts of things but in terms of being in the nitty-gritty and understanding all the minutiae of what's changed and who's done this and whether that that needs kind of a, a more of a full-time role so I think probably the, the sort of the, the tail end bit of it um I, i'm not as actively involved of, of, a, of a project but actually in terms of the design of it and even through to the technical stuff and i love just you know i love being in a workshop or a design team meeting and and uh you know still showing the kids that you've still got it you know working through a detail or just or just or sometimes just coming at it fresh and just going like did anyone think of doing it like that or and like, yeah, sure. Okay. So, um, I mean, maybe they just do that to kind of placate me and actually they just ignore me behind my back, <laughs> but it, it feels good to me. <laughs> Love it. And and the, the roles between you and, and Laura, how have they, you know, has, has there been a kind of clear distinction between, you know, you're involved in winning the work and kind of front end type of stuff and Laura's more involved in operations, for example? Um, has that been, how, how have you guys kind of discussed or, you know, made that relationship or the roles be evenly distributed, if you like? Yeah, I mean, um, it, it pretty much is kind of how, how you've just said, it, actually. So, yeah, sort of, but it's more about what, what we actually enjoy um, as much as what we're potentially good at. So, right. Um, yeah, I'm quite happy to go and talk to a random room full of strangers and, and kind of and, and pitch and kind of do those various things. Whereas Lara, you know, that's not na naturally where she wants to be if she's got a choice. Although we, I think we do it both, probably do it both best when we do it together because we, because of the relationship and we naturally, you know, know where to step in if someone's stumbling on something or where, you know, where to, to elevate things. She's also got an incredibly annoying knack of just like meeting someone for about five seconds and getting to know them way better than I have in about three years, which is incredibly, <laughs> well, it's a talent, but it's also very annoying for me. And uh, she'll be like, did you yeah. know that they did this? And I was like, no, I've known them since I, was, I went to school with them. Um, <laughs> so that, and I guess also the the nature of, of, you know, where we are with our personal lives as well. So we've got two young kids, well, not so young now, they're six and nine, but the, um, mm -hmm. Lara took some time out of the business when they when they were younger and stuff. So that nat naturally meant that things kind of moved on in, in a slightly different way. So she still likes to kind of run a project. So she'd probably naturally, you know, if we do, and we don't do that much residential, but if we do kind of a, a high end residential project, that would be the one that she'd just gravitate towards. She doesn't want to sit in a in a in a room with with twenty five M and E engineers. So I think the kind of project side, and also you know, very much in terms of you were saying about the kind of tone of voice and. Uh, and the and the sort of style of how we present ourselves online and our forward face in terms of Instagram and website that's all very much her domain. Um, so yeah, there, there are there are different, but also nothing's out of bounds. Like I would never say I'm going to meet this client, you're not coming, and you know, vice versa. And she'd never say this is this is you know this is the project, this is the press we're getting. You know, do you want to? You know, you can't look at it. So it's still very much a team, um, and we share opinions, and I think we. Yeah, uh, ultimate trust, I guess, is the main thing that she knows I'm not going to do anything, you know, bad or stupid or and, and likewise me with her. But um, equally, a second opinion is always quite kind of good to seek out and no matter what you're looking at. Yeah. Um, you guys are entering into this, you know, the kind of interesting mid-tier scale of practice and, you know, kind of 22 people. And we were kind of discussing a little bit earlier about there's, you know, there's a whole load of changes that tend to happen. We often talk about it in the the powers of three. So, you know, three, nine, 27, 81. Mm. There's, there's these sorts of big shifts that happen in a business where everything that you were doing previously now suddenly stops working as well. And there needs to be a little bit of a, a, a change. Have you started to see you know what how are you preparing for the future growth do you want to maintain where you're at or do you have visions of taking the business further and what kinds of challenges might you be foreseeing or already yeah experiencing? i don't 
I mean, we've, we've, we've kind of hovered around this number, you know, a little bit up, a little bit down um, for a while. And I think, I think this is our sort of our comfort zone. We don't want to, we don't want to just relentlessly pursue kind of growth. Um, I think there's a danger that you can, um, you, you end up sort of chasing numbers on a spreadsheet. Oh, we've got to hit this target. We've got to be doing that this month. And you're just sort of looking at the numbers rather than looking at the product. So I think the, sure. the size that, that we are is a great size. Like it's a really good, you know, we can still all physical things that like we can still be in like, you know, one studio space together. We all know each other. We know each other's boyfriends, girlfriends, what's going on in there. And I think you lose that. I think we, I was on a, on a course, a, a leadership course for kind of founders of, of, um, different studios a few years ago, albeit we were, well, we were the only architects there, but the, everyone else was from, you know, branding or graphics or marketing or, mm-hmm. um, illustration you know but everyone found that exactly as you said that powers of three i think i think they weren't as optimistic as you because someone a few people in there said that 26 was the specific number where your studio becomes something different so i mean pretty much bang on what you're saying whereby you just suddenly you're splitting into teams or you've got two people running different projects or or you 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 can't invite partners to things because there's suddenly too many of you whatever it is so no i think um the the size that we are um I mean, never say never, but we're, we're certainly not looking to kind of grow up to 81 and, um, and hit that next power of three, that's for sure. And, and what, what's the, what does the internal structure kind of look like? So obviously you guys have got, uh, you know, you've got a broad base of different sort of disciplines that you're, that you're working in around. Is it a project, is it like a kind of studio format or you've got multiple studios or multiple teams? How, how does the internal logic look like in the business? And- we're um we're all one big happy family of course the no we, we actually generally are so we everyone no there aren't separate studios we are all we're all under one roof we are all you know we all kind of look at things together we obviously resource things separately on a project by project basis and kind of give each one their own hierarchy but um typically those teams report back to the senior tier who kind of uh, oversee it but um no in terms of, there's no division between interiors or architecture or graphics we sometimes we do projects that are just interiors in which case obviously that's it's more of a kind of a resourcing thing but it's still got the same structure it's still got the same kind of reporting likewise with architecture but i guess the kind of most interesting bit and hopefully the bit that we've been successful with within our within our structure is that everyone inputs into every project um so every time we get a new brief uh we have a brainstorm very early on everyone gets around everyone throws ideas in the hat um whether that's kind of early concept early brief pitching and we'll do that a few times through the beginning and because the and more often than um amanda our kind of graphics person at the moment she's got incredible knowledge of of architecture she'll come up with loads of references that none of us would ever have come up with likewise the interiors guys will might come up with a slightly different bias than you know than the architecture people so we're getting all these kind of mixing melting pot of ideas and same with with you know the kind of support guys and the studio managers and, and, the, and the administration people is that, you know, everyone has an opinion. And it, I think it's really important that, you know, someone might be, not be an architect, but they did fine art, or they might not be an architect or an interior designer, but they've got a real interest in, you know, food or fashion or film or whatever that is. And it's, you know, mm-hmm. oh, I saw this, I saw this amazing, you know, Japanese film noir at the weekend. I thought, r- remind me of that. What do you think? And suddenly that can lead you down a path so that openness and that structure i think is probably what makes us unique in that we have, we are genuinely are a kind of proper melting pot of ideas and then we refine that obviously as the as the project develops amazing brilliant what are you guys what are you looking forward to over the next 12 months next 12 months what have we got on the cars we're really excited about um a pod Japanese style pod hotel a hostel should I say that we've been working on which is really exciting so I think everyone's kind of familiar with the typology in Japan um with in the open UK pod, you know tiny little we're doing in the UK yes yeah, so, I mean it's again it's in Soho so um that's really exciting and that's one that we've done the interiors and the architecture so that's gonna be great that's on site at the moment coming together sort of this time next year um we've got some great hospitality projects we're looking at some kind of bars and restaurants we're looking at another members club um office space we've got a new one in king's cross so there's there's a real kind of uh, mixture mixture of projects coming through and I, uh, again kind of back to my earlier point that's exactly the way we like it so yeah it doesn't matter on the size or the scale or the shape or the form or the typology it's all about that have they got that entrepreneurial spirit and um are they up for 
having some fun along the way. And if it is, then sounds like something for us. Amazing. Brilliant. It's a perfect place to conclude the conversation. Russell, that's been absolutely brilliant. So I really brilliant. appreciate your time. Great to catch up. Afternoon. Excellent. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.